Welcome to our mid-afternoon talk. Uh, the general theme of the next two talks is on information security. We've got uh, Dr. Sky Crosser from uh, Crosser. Crosser, thank you, uh, from Curtin University. Um, she's going to be speaking about free and open source software and activism. Um, I'll just pass it to you. Thank you. anyone not hear me? Okay, great. Uh, that's me, obviously. All right, so what I'm going to be talking about today is firstly going through a bit of background on my experience so you know why I'm talking about this and where I'm coming from, uh, and having a whole heap of caveats and limitations for what I am talking about and what I'm not talking about, and then shift on to talking about some of the tools that activists need. Um, in the second part, I'm going to talk about some of the ways in which FOSS communities and activist communities are and aren't connecting up with each other. Uh, and then finally, some suggestions for possible responses. So to start off with, um, I'm not a programmer. I'm a researcher. I have a PhD in political science. I've been using Linux for quite a while. Um, if I have some of the technical stuff wrong, please feel free to correct me in the question session or come up to me afterwards. It also means that I will possibly accidentally use some jargon from social science-y things. If you want a clarification on what a particular term means, please feel free to put your hand up and stop me and I'll explain. If you have questions, please save them to the end. Or uh, I, this is not so much a question as a comment. Also, maybe save that for the break time. Um, so my research mostly looks at how activists are using technology, but also how activists are trying to shape different technologies. And I've done research in Karachi and Nairobi, recently in Oakland, looking at how Occupy Oakland is using technology. Um, I'm also an activist myself, and I do various bits and pieces around the place with varying degrees of excitement. Um, secondly, I'm going to be talking I'm going to be making some really broad brush strokes here. So if I was giving a lecture on my research, I would probably be speaking in much more finely grained detail and I'd be able to say things far more exactly. But I think generalizations are probably going to be a bit more helpful. So if I say something like, the FOSS community is generally quite apolitical, and you're like, what? I'm, I'm a member of three different political parties. Don't be offended. I'm not talking about you. I'm kind of making these broad brush strokes, and we can talk about detail more later. Um, so, to start off with though, uh, I want to clarify what I mean by activists here, because technically an activist is anyone who advocates for a cause. So probably you are all activists in some sense. Um, I'm going to be using activist it, as a shorthand in this talk, particularly for people involved in a certain in certain kinds of activities. So firstly, I'm talking about likeable movements, which is a term from social sciences. We talk about the need to do more research on unlikable movements, which is you know neo-Nazis and people like that. I don't really care about them. I don't really want them to use FOSS. I don't care at all. Um, <laughs> I'm thinking about movements mostly that are involved in the left and particularly the far left. I'm also looking more at organizational forms that tend towards horizontal power structures. So people who are involved in collectives, people who are involved in affinity groups, which is like a group of your friends who go out and do stuff and are of a similar level of willingness to get arrested. <laughs> um, I'm also thinking more about kind of smaller organizations. So I'm not talking so much about Amnesty or Greenpeace or groups like that, but kind of smaller groups often between you know, five people and 50 people, but not always. Activists who are open to a diversity of tactics. So diversity of tactics is used as a polite code word um, in many activist communities for being willing to occasionally break stuff, including the law. Um, so obviously, your willingness to break the law differs very much depending on which system you're working in. So, uh, if you are in an authoritarian regime, being willing to go out and march might be enough to get you potentially arrested to count as, you know, diversity of, diversity of tactics tending towards illegal action. In Australia, that means quite different things. So people who, who get involved in black bloc, which is a particular tactic where you will cover your face and will be willing to do things like resist the police if they push at you. 
um, and occasionally engage in property damage. And finally, I'm talking mostly about those who are calling for structural change. So people who aren't saying we need to fix the system, but we need radical changes to the system. Um, and uh, th those might include restructuring democracy, not accepting that representative democracy goes far enough. So whenever I say activists, think of all that. Just kind of jam that into your little box of activism for now. So what do activists need? Firstly, they need secure communications. Um, so some of this is for day-to-day, -day, on the ground actions. So um, for example, a large action I went to in Occupy Oakland, there was a need to know uh, where the police were, where they were massing, where people had been, um, where people had been arrested, wh when tear gas was coming out and how to get away from the tear gas. Uh, and also things like, okay, well, our primary target has now been blocked off by the police what will we do to get to our secondary target and what is our secondary target and who is here and what do we do now. Um, activists are not so great at a lot of that. <laughs> um, also need secure communications for day-to-day -day stuff, so being able to have mailing list chatter and that kind of thing, um, to share documents, to talk about, usually not like the fine-grained de detail of strategy, most Activists I know would be very, very leery of doing that online, even over things that seem secure. Um, yeah, uh, and then they also need effective ways of communicating outwards. So how, how to make sure that they reach audiences well. So that might include using things like Twitter or Facebook, um, doing press releases, uh, putting together um, putting together zines, putting together websites, all of that kind of stuff. Uh, and it's important to remember that the issues with security that we have with this aren't just issues in authoritarian regimes. Yes, it matters very much in places like uh, Iran or Egypt or so on, uh, but it also matters for people here. Uh, there's a lot of evidence that anti-coal activists in Australia are being surveilled, anti-nuclear activists are also under surveillance. Um, there was a case in New Zealand where police um, put a whole heap of activists under surveillance for six months and then conducted armed raids where I think about 400 people got arrested and they were also having people show up on doorsteps and saying, here's the last six months of logs from your mobile phone. Can you explain this thing you said back in December? Um, so yeah, when we're thinking about this, don't think about that as just something that's happening over there far away, but also something that people here need to be concerned about. Um, also need to think about secure data storage. So that might include uh, things like complex details of plans that are going ahead or documents that we're sharing, but also things like just storing everybody's phone number somewhere that everyone can reach it. Um, uh, also need the kind of everyday things that people will use anyway, so word, whoop, word processing software, stuff for making videos, stuff for doing design. Um, and all of this kind of needs to suit the organisational forms that we're talking about. So often there's a priority put on not being hierarchical, which means that you can't have bottlenecks in the process, or as far as possible you want to avoid them. You can't have or you don't want to have just one person who does this one thing. You want everyone to be able to access, access the tool if necessary and everyone to be able to use the tool if necessary. All right. Um, so talking a bit more of security, uh, you will probably all have heard of at least two out of three of these tales of woe. So um, one of them is Haystack, which was announced in 2009. Has anyone not heard of that? No? Okay, There's some in the room, so I can continue explaining. So Haystack was heralded in mainstream media sources as this exciting new project that would allow people, particularly in Iran, to communicate anonymously um, and you know, manage government surveillance effectively. Uh, the problem was that initially the, the code was all closed and they wouldn't let anyone look at it and when finally they did, people sort of went, ah, oh, this is full of vulnerabilities all over the place and it's since been taken down. Um, 
Skype is also important because activists think of it as being secure or did think of it as being secure until recently. Um, so lots and lots of people would use that, people who weren't willing to use mobile phones or landlines or other communications. Um, in 2006, it admitted to filtering key, keywords from IM conversations to meet with Chinese law. There's also been reports of it being used for surveillance by, Chinese, by the Chinese government. Um, as you can see, 2010 also reports of problems in Libya and Egypt. Uh, and now there's just been, I think just a few days ago, uh, there were calls, more calls for transparency from Skype. But this does highlight the problem of relying so much on a tool which activists don't control. Uh, and there was a good talk on previously about mobile phone communications, but that's more suited for local. I and mean, a lot of people still need to have international communications to maintain international links and those need to be cheap and they need to be secure and there's not really anything available that does that well. Um, there's also been some uh, viruses that target specifically opponents of China. So in 2012 there were reports of a Trojan that was targeting Tibetan activists. Um, so email was being sent to the Central Tibet Administration and the International Campaign for Tibet and it was specifically focused on a Tibetan religious festival so um, you know there does seem to be some evidence that people wanted to get those people specifically um, and then last year also reports of a Trojan that was target, targeting Uyghur activists and that was for Mac and for Windows. Uh, so I, I, think, I think a lot of activists try to sneak by with just using Mac and being like, well, it's, it's new and shiny and it's anti-establishment, so... <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, so the point of these tales of war is to illustrate that there are, there are multiple points of vulnerability and a lot of activists focus on their struggles. They're, you know, very, very deeply embedded in what they're doing. They don't necessarily have the time to focus on other things. They don't necessarily know that opening zip attachments isn't always a very good idea. Um, yeah, so FOSS is not necessarily going to solve these problems, but it is more, more suited, I think, to many activist uses because it's community controlled for all the reasons you already know. It's community controlled, it can meet user needs and it's easy, easier to open it up and see what's happening inside and if there's anything worrying there. Um, so in addition to this, we also need to think about the everyday hassles. So as well as specific viruses targeting activist communities, there is just everyday viruses and lots, <coughs> lots and lots of activist groups don't have the technological expertise even to really work out what to do with that. I mean, I've been working with groups where you have the typical thing, you open up the Windows computer and get a thousand alerts for a thousand different things. And they're just like, oh, just shut all those and wait for 10 minutes and then you can start doing your thing. Um, there's the financial costs. A lot of activists like to engage in remixing and culture jamming and um, you know reappropriation of symbols stuff like photo um, manipulation software is really useful for that but uh, Adobe Photoshop is kind of out of the reach of most activist organizations for the, the charity bundle comes for what four hundred dollars so that's definitely an issue um, there's also the lack of support and training for using new tools so as with most small organizations, activists often don't have the technical expertise to teach themselves new stuff and install it and know what to do when it breaks. Um, there's also a certain ideological awkwardness in using proprietary software that activists often manage to ignore. So I, I just pulled up a few of the campaigns against large multinational corporations there. There's been some great ones against Shell, Nestle, Serco, uh, I think Goldman Sachs, BHP Billiton. So a lot of activists are spending much of their time talking about how awful international, internationally um, mobile capital is and how terrible these vast corporations are. And I will just get back to writing that email on my Mac. <laughs> so um, it's a bit embarrassing, frankly. <laughs> um, I, I particularly like this Shell ad. Shell opened up a social media experiment where they let people 
put some slogans over their images, and um, it went really well. <laughs> okay, so we are on to part two, thinking about what's happening already. So there are connections being made, and people are people within an activist communities are kind of realizing that maybe there is this thing called FOSS and maybe it might be useful. So I'm starting to see it over the last few years pop up in some of the discourse being used by activists. So for example, Vandana Shiva, who is a very well-known figure in the left in the global justice movement, and she is a seed activist in India who campaigns for open seeds, as she sometimes calls it. So seeds that are freely available to use and to share and not controlled by large multinational corporations. In this case, Monsanto has been saying that FOSS is similarly a way of spreading prosperity and knowledge in society in the same way as saving and swapping seeds. So the fact that people are making those analogies are useful and provide an opening point for people to get engaged with FOSS. There's also some really great organizations that are starting to provide training and support for FOSS for collectives, although often they're focusing more at the NGO level rather than at kind of more informal activist spaces. So there's an organization I work with sometimes in Bangalore called Janasta, who are really cool. Um, the Tactical Technology Collective, has anyone heard of them? Yeah, they're, they're really cool um, as well. They put out a lot of something in a box sets for activists. So it might be security in a box or design in a box or something like that. And as well as putting emphasis on all of that being free and open source software, there's also a good emphasis on design. So things that not only work well and meet activist needs and especially tailored for activist needs, but also look good, which, which kind of matters, right? Um, especially for movements which often put a priority on playfulness and trying to engage with their audiences through um, interesting campaigns and interesting designs. Uh, Rise Up also provides a lot of communications infrastructure, although they were recently raided in the US, I think, so some problems there. Also seen a lot of connections coming out of Occupy. So um, this is a useful quotation here from somebody involved in Occupy Wall Street. Um, she talks about Occupy in the sense that there is leadership in the sense of deference, just as people defer to Linus Torvalds. But the moment people stop respecting Torvalds, they can fork it. So uh, just checking, has anyone not heard of Occupy? OK, right. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Um, so it, again, this idea of like, well, they're implementing the open source model in terms of day-to-day -day politics and, well, if anyone doesn't like what's going on in this camp, they can start their own Occupy camp and everything will be fine. Um, I think in some ways, though, um, oh, I should also mention as well that there are some groups that are specifically providing FOSS or as FOSS as possible support to Occupy. So there's a group called Tech Ops that has been doing that in New York, I think. Um, I think though that in some ways this trend in Occupy is linked to the fact that Occupy has really spread online. So you can see that in that a lot of the people who are involved in Occupy will be wearing the anonymous mask and a lot of the people who I was talking to about their politics clearly got a lot of their politics from having watched FIFA Vendetta and watched some anonymous videos. <laughs> um, so uh, not all, there's definitely a core of anarchist organizers and other people who have, who have been involved in Occupy who have kind of a longer background of ac activist experience, but there's a lot of people who came to Occupy through the internet and brought with them a lot of internet culture, which is really cool in some ways, but it also means that I should take with a pinch of salt the idea that because Occupy likes open source, activists more generally do. Um, so I'm going to talk about a case study here now, which is um, just a fancy way of saying anecdotal experience. <laughs> uh, so uh, I'm talking about this magazine avenue that my collective and I put out in Perth. <coughs> Um, Avenue is a anarchist 
ish magazine that's available online at unnamedavenue.org uh, to some extent. <laughs> Um, and we have had various problems with our process that I have tried to solve with FOSS and failed. So I'm using this as a case study to look at what it actually looks like when activists fail to use FOSS and why. Um, so to start off with, the aim is to do something that's relatively high quality. A lot of uh, anarchist-ish publications are zines which are like you cut some things out and you stick them to some paper and then you use your work, work photocopier to make copies and like, which is great. I really like the aesthetic, but um, the group wanted to do something a little bit different here. Um, so it is entirely self-financed by the collective. We have a circulation of 500 to 700 copies. It comes out every couple of months and it is totally free. Um, yeah, so sounds good to me. Uh, so the things that we need in order to do this, we need ways to do editing. So that includes getting contributions from people, making the edits, then putting those contributions that have been edited back in some location where we can then reach them. Ways to do layout, um, also ways to keep the data secure. So we do have some people who contribute an anonymously and some people who might advocate questionably legal actions who don't necessarily want to put their name on things and who want to make sure that the article isn't traceable to them. Um, okay, so the initial process, I joined the group after they'd already put together the first um, edition, was to do the layout in InDesign, which created a lot of bottlenecks because only like two or three people knew how to use it. So it meant you all had to wait for that. There are also issues with accessing articles in the process of editing, like who actually has a copy of this article to edit and then where has the, the edited version gone um, and so on. Uh, also people using uh, Mac to edit files that were then unreadable to other people and people didn't know how to switch them around. Um, and there was also a, an issue with the lack of access to the website. So for a while we had a website, it was shiny and it was lovely, um, but we, the only way to get things on it was to contact a very overworked person who was volunteering for us and to bug him until he did things. It was not so convenient. Um, so the solution that I attempted was firstly to talk about how great Voss was and how it would help us with all these problems and everything was going to be great and shiny. Um, I did a little bit of research on layout tools. I found Scribus, which looked good. I haven't done much layout myself, but I figured pff, people who've done InDesign, they can learn Scribus. It'll be easy, no problems. Um, tried to get as many people to use LibreOffice as possible, um, and then also used a few other tools. So we were already using Gmail, so kept kind of trying to do that with better processes and trying to maybe use Dropbox a bit as well to put things in and take things out probably not ideal in terms of security. Uh, all of my fantastic plans have come to naught. So firstly, several people had trouble even installing InDesign. I had to spend lots of hours like fiddling with things and clicking things and Googling things to get it installed, but I couldn't even do that for everyone within the group because some people are too irritating to work with. Um, <laughs> In terms of shifting to LibreOffice, that's also problematic because our standard fonts that we were using to be nice and tidy weren't available in LibreOffice, so that took another few hours of like working through that to try to get the right fonts installed and then they weren't the right fonts and everyone was sad. Um, and what happened after this excellent new revision of our process was that one person ended up doing pretty much all of the de design in InDesign. Um, at future meetings, we then discussed, well, what, what can we do about that? And we decided to go with uh, cutting and pasting paper onto sheets. Mm -hmm. But I think what we will actually see happening is two people doing it all in InDesign. Mm -hmm. Right, so why did I fail so badly? Partly, obviously, for practical reasons, but partly also because the politics of FOSS is not necessarily convincing to activists. Um, there is a lot of stuff, I mean obviously we have the open source position which is largely that FOSS isn't political, it's just technically better. Well that's not really very convincing for activists when they're like, yeah, but this thing doesn't work. So can't really convince them on that front. Um, and then 
the, the free software position, which draws on this idea of free as in freedom, and it's all about your individual liberty, and you should have control over the code, so on and so forth, um, is also unfortunately not that convincing for many activists, because the, the ideology of free as in freedom um, is seen is really polluted by the way in which it's used by the US and in US politics. It's seen as very individualistic. It's used as a cover for you know terrible behavior overseas, terrible behavior internally. You know, for freedom, we will now implement these terrible anti-terrorist laws internally and send drones to kill children in Pakistan. Doesn't really work necessarily as a discourse. Um, Activists t tend to think, particularly anarchist activists, tend to think more about autonomy, which is you have individual freedom and you have individual control, but that's always in the context of a community and your relationship with the community. So that's not necessarily averse to the politics, you know, it doesn't necessarily run against the politics of open source, but the, the language being used of free as in freedom doesn't necessarily match up easily. Um, so. Uh, there's, and there's also a perception of, of the open source community and like this idea that it's a heap of white dudes who like maybe mm -hmm. aren't going to be that excited about working with activists. And um, so there's a, a perception of a cultural clash. Like when I have suggested, well, maybe we could talk to some other people who could come and do training. There's this idea that that will just socially not be a pleasant experience for anyone concerned. I should, should point out that a lot of people, a lot of activists are a bunch of white dudes who don't deal well with other people. So, <laughs> uh, yeah, so some tentative suggestions. Firstly, to acknowledge and confront structural inequality and do things to make like FOSS communities seem more awesome and diverse, like implementing codes of conduct and providing childcare at events, for example. But or, secondly, to accept that FOSS is political and then to think about how it's political. Like to actually think more about the politics that you want to adopt and uh, what that means to you and how that is going to connect or disconnect you from other communities outside of FOSS. Um, to think about the connections as going both ways. So if you do want to get engaged with activist communities, and obviously that's a big if, you may be like, troublemakers, I don't like them. No. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, but if you do, don't think of yourself as just teaching them how to use a tool. Also think about what you might get out of the experience. A lot of activist communities have really great experience in terms of um, lobbying and advocacy and direct action and stuff like that that FOSS communities could draw on. They also have a lot of experience in running events well, running safe spaces, making sure that everyone gets a chance to speak. They have really great political analysis sometimes sometimes really not. Um, and finally, don't believe everything you see on the news. So in the same way that people have um, quite, you know, so people have a stereotype about geeky communities as being, you know, socially awkward and stuff like that in the mainstream, still there's this idea that a lot of activists are dressed in black and just smashing windows and doing nothing else. Um, and there's some interesting research on how that gets formed. But yeah, that is not entirely true. So question the things that you see when you see uh, um, a news, mainstream news coverage that says things like, and then the riot turned violent at exactly the same point that the riot police turned up often. Um, <laughs> odd odd cor correlation there. Um, okay, so I think that is my time well up. Any questions? Good. <laughs> Give you the mic. Slightly tangent, slightly tangential, but if um, no one else is asking, can you recommend a good anarchist 101? Like it, so I don't really understand the sort of basis of anarchism, and there are lots of people who are doing good stuff, but I sort of want to know where they're coming from. Do you have reading materials, something? Um, I can put them up on my site immediately after this. And for those who don't know, the basic idea of anarchy is that, I guess you could say, all power corrupts and that communities should make decisions themselves rather than having power imposed from the top. 
all decisions should be made at the level of the people who they affect. Um, which doesn't mean you don't have any organisation, it just means you aim for non-hierarchical organisation. Yeah, I, I don't know what I mean to mind, I guess. The, um, the Uh huh. And um, like, did you think about prototyping or anything like that at all? And when I say prototyping, I mean just like starting up with like a little bit smaller than a wholesale uh, replacement. Um, we have. I've tried that in bits. Yeah. So I've tried doing a little bit of like, oh, instead of using this this program, you could use LibreOffice and just trying to switch things through as much as possible. Also, as it became clear that that wasn't going to work for layout, um, we tried to do a thing where instead of laying out the whole magazine in one program, we uh, split it up. So I'd say, OK, well, you three here try to work out Scribus and try to lay out this one <coughs> thing. Um, and I think that that could have worked, if maybe if we'd had a bit more support. But a lot of the people who are involved in the group aren't very confident with new technologies. Um, yeah, so the, they, their initial hurdles were enough to make them feel discouraged and stop. And I don't have enough experience either with Layout or with Scribus to, to fix that. Okay. Hello, is this on? Yeah, thanks. Uh, sorry, there's no switch here, so I can't tell. Um, uh, yeah, I just was wondering, like, just in terms of, of, of um, um, social theory or just, uh, just um, on an organisational theory, uh, because um, these sorts of a activist uh, organisations are not hierarchical. Um, then, how has anybody studied what the social process is um, of uh, adopting some sort of new process? I mean, how does how does a new process get adopted in an, in an organisation which is not hierarchical, and how does that differ from one that that is hierarchical? And there's there like some some like meta thing going on here that uh, that you could learn from. Yeah, this, this is definitely a thing that activists think about a lot. Like, this is not surprising. Um, I'm guessing most of you know how processes get adopted in hierarchical organizations. You probably had at least some experience with that. So I won't go over that as a contrast. But it depends on the group. Groups do things differently. Often it is uh, through a process of consensus, which can take a really, really long time. So like, OK, if we want to shift from using this tool to using that tool, we will all sit together in a room and talk about it until everyone agrees that that's for the best. Um, other times people do do it by voting, but usually by more than a majority. So like if, if three quarters of the group agree to it. But usually because it's based on people's voluntary participation, people won't go ahead with process changes unless everyone kind of agrees to it. That's the theoretical model of like kind of what happens and what people want to happen. Of course, some things also just happen kind of by accident. Somebody starts using a thing to do a particular bit over here, and then other people decide they like it or they don't. And that person gets denounced, expelled from the group. Everybody points at them, the Judean People's Front. <laughs> <laughs> Happily, we don't do that so much in the groups I'm involved with. Mostly, it's a process of consensus. and. Um, caring what other people think as well. Like, it's not about winning the debate, it's about trying to find something that everyone's happy with and can work with effectively. Uh, hi, two, uh, two little feedback things, I guess. One is, do you know about Libra Graphics Magazine? Pardon? Libra Graphics Magazine. They're uh, an anarchist, Canadian-based, uh, free software uh, design magazine. Oh, I do. I've got, okay. I downloaded all of that. And then, cool. Uh, well, the reason I mentioned them is I know they use a fully free software workflow for doing their layout. Okay. So I wonder if getting in touch with them might help you solve some of the issues that you had here. Mm -hmm. um, and then the other question I have is, if you're going to do this sort of thing again or try to help free software have more of an impact in the communities you're a part of, what can we do to help you? Okay. Um, well, as I said, the first thing that there are many things you can do. Firstly, if, if you're interested in things that people are doing, make yourself available. Um, anarchists don't have money, but we have good cakes. 
often. <laughs> we cater excellently for a wide range of dietary requirements. <laughs> so just like going up to somebody at a protest or event that's being held and saying like, hey, do you have any needs with stuff like that? Um, being willing to recognize that the language that's being used will probably be quite different. So you'll get yeah, that there might be a few things happening there in terms of like developing some shared communication strategies. Um, being willing to engage in processes that may not seem efficient as well. But I mean, just very concretely, uh, you personally, in your particular organizations yeah. that you're a part of, what can we in this room help you with personally? Do you need like email addresses from us or IRC channels to go to or someone to come to these meetings in particular? Okay, well, the thing with the, this particular group that I'm working with is that they really privilege face-to-face -face organizations. So if anyone is in Perth and wants to help out with this stuff, maybe run a, a training s session in Scribus, that would be great. Um, for people not in Perth, um, you know, find other more other deserving activists to give you vegan cakes. <laughs> there are plenty of us around hiding out without vegan cupcakes. <laughs> hey, I'm an activist that uh, I'm a filmmaker. Mm -hmm. But um, I'm just I was, uh, throughout you talking about this, I kept on trying to contemplate how FOSS could help me. And I'm very technologically savvy. Um, I mean, that's how I started out, but then the technology turned into freeing education and then how are we going to do it, and then I showed how. But uh, how could something like FOSS help someone that is already you know, well established in what they're doing? Well, I guess that depends on what you're doing and what you want to do. With do you, would you look at what, would you look at what, yeah. editing or um, if, depending on how you want to communicate with people. I mean, it really depends on what you do day to day and how you want to reach people. Well, well, that's my main problem is reaching people, and I'm trying to reach, I mean, uh, I'm doing quite well with it, but um, I got no money. I mean, I'm homeless. I live in the mountains, so it's like, how am I going to, you know, reach as many people as possible? Yeah, well, I mean, part of that is also recognizing that FOSS can't do all the things that we would love it to do. Um, not necessarily in terms of the software capabilities, but like, much as I would love to think that an excellent, some excellent design and layout software would help me to effectively reach out and turn Perth into an anarchist haven that will convince everyone to rise up and set up our own communal gardens and childcare centres. Um, however great the tools you use are, you're still kind of working against a system that's not that conducive to helping you. So recognising the limitations of what you can and can't do is important. <coughs> Um, I'd like to get uh, everybody's view on this FOSS's political thing here. I know where I stand everybody's on that. View. I feel strong. It's going to take a while. Yeah, no, no, the people in the room. Could I have a, a raise of hands <laughs> of people who accept that FOSS is political? Can I maybe outline? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, uh, well, that's, that's true, but I, I just want to say to you that I work exclusively with community groups. I run an IT service um, that you know, for 14 years has been working with groups like yours, yeah. so I'm pretty up on this. And one day when Linus was at one of these conferences, I ran up to him all excited as you would be to see the head penguin. Um, and, and I told him all the great social progress we had made because of his work, you yeah. know, and, and how proud I was. And he looked at me and he said, Daryl, you sound like a nice guy, but you know, I honestly don't care about any of that. I just like to write really good code. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I'm not so sure that the FOSS angle is the way to go because, you know, I push it with the community sector all the time. And even though once they're using FOSS, they understand and they're proud of it and, and it is compatible with what they're doing, um, you know, FOSS is not a reason in itself for them to use the software. What's important with community groups is their goals and empowering them to reach those goals. And you know, quite frankly, if there's commercial software that'll do that better than FOSS, that's what we'll recommend. Yeah, and I recognize that. Um, I should perhaps have outlined a little more what I meant when I said that FOSS is political. Um, I don't mean that people who produce FOSS are political. I mean political in the deeper sense of the practices of how we go about work and how we live our lives and everyday living. So yeah, so yeah. If, you, if you think, it's not necessarily good politics. I mean, I, I think it is, but not necessarily. Like the choice between using Windows or using Ubuntu or another, um, another flavor of Linux is a political choice, even if we don't recognize it as that. 
it's a choice between supporting different modes of organization, different modes of um, different economic modes, different ways of relating to each other. And it's political in that sense. Yeah. And activists are very good, particularly anarchist activists are very good at recognizing those everyday choices as being political, which is why people actually care whether or not you have vegan cupcakes and cater to all dietary requirements and have childcare available and um, you know, have progressive speaking lists and stuff like that because all those small things matter in terms of the politics of everyday life and the kind of world we're trying to build. And FOSS is political in that sense. The decision of what software to use is political because it affects who has power and who doesn't. A government or company will never build an off-the-record chat system. It will never build a way of sharing files with no backdoors for checking for content. It can't be. It will not be done. Yeah. So, you know, it has to be political. They kind of have to stop that, or eventually the MPA has to give up. Yeah, and that's why I think activists should use FOSS or should think about using FOSS. Um, but it, it, they don't always recognise that. Sometimes it's easier to use what's there than to find somebody and say, we really need this, can you build it? And I think, oh, sorry, I'll, maybe while that's passing, I'll say that um, often it's easier for FOSS projects to support humanitarian projects and things like that that are kind of less overtly radical. I was just going to say, from my experience with groups uh, I've worked with, um, Burnout and succession planning is like a big problem and then especially yeah. with open source you'll get the next guy comes in he'll just pick another thing totally different, different, different again. I'm just wondering do you have any tips on how we can avoid that and that's probably a hard question to answer but if you have any insights. Um, yeah, that's something that uh, the groups I work with have been talking about a lot and part of it is um, taking care of each other as much as possible, small things like making sure there's food at meetings, uh, making sure there are good processes for resolving interpersonal conflicts. There's often not. Um, yeah, so th th there's lots of little bits and pieces that can be done. There's no like grand overarching, here is the thing that will fix it, but there's lots of small things. And also being willing to recognize that a lot of the work involved in activism is day-to-day -day emotional work is helping people who feel discouraged, helping people who have difficult interpersonal relations, doing small things that help things go well. Was there a... Yep. I just want to say that uh, for a decade in Sydney, there was a group called Catalyst that, are you familiar with Catalyst yourself? I think I've heard of them in yep. passing, yeah. And that was a basically free software group of people in Sydney who provided resources for activists. So the question was asked, what can free software do? Well, it can keep improving and make itself more usable but mainly all the tools are already there. What activists need is people to get together and train and hold workshops. And what Catalyst did in Sydney was hold regular workshops, had a squat space where they had computers, they had secure you know, technology. So the activists who didn't know what to do could still come down, know they're on a safe computer, know their IPs were not being logged and tracked, and go off and do whatever they do. And that group disbanded through burnout and a few other reasons about six years ago. But it needs people now, it needs time, it needs you know, get involved in those things you're interested in. And if you don't want to get arrested or lock yourself onto something, you can still train the activists who do how to be secure because the tools are there. Skype was never secure, but other tools are there right now you can use instead. So get out, get amongst it and enable people. And that's what we are, we're enablers. And we can get out there and do that. Yeah. Is there anyone? I thought it was interesting that the um, Department of Defence talk is right after this one. <laughs> uh, I, I note it with interest. <laughs> I was going to ask, how do, we, how do we empower people to actually um, act on the change that they want to see in the world, regardless of what it is? Depends on the change you want to see in the world, really. Um, in terms of the things I'm looking at, uh, I mean, often there is an urgent need to resist particular legislation to raise awareness of it. I think that that's something that people associated with the FOSS community have often been quite good at in terms of like copyright stuff particularly, and there's far more awareness of that. Uh, I am a big fan of building 
building processes that work now that will help people see that this is possible. So one of the major crit critiques that you often get of anarchism is like, oh, it sounds lovely, but there's no way that would ever work. And so building spaces that are organized non-hierarchically that actually do the things that you say you want the world to look like helps to convince people that that is actually possible. So rather than saying, well, in my ideal utopia, you know, we would do X, Y, and Z. Think, well, how can I make X, Y, and Z happen here now, even if it's just on a tiny scale? Because people ne often need to experience that to believe that there's an alternative. A lot of people think that what we have now is the only possible version of the world, and even if it's not very nice, that's kind of, you know, the best we have, so you might as well live with it. Are there any more questions? I thought your choice of a printed magazine was inter interesting in today's world. Is there a reason why? Because you know, uh, paper publishing is very complex, as you have found out, whereas something like WordPress is pretty easy. Um, was there a reason why you do that on paper rather than online? Yeah, um, as I said, I came to the group after they'd already started up and they've made this decision. Um, part of it is that. Um, people still kind of privilege the idea of face-to-face -face stuff and in-person stuff and um, I guess the, the ideas of authenticity and realness that surround that. But the other thing was the idea was to not create something that you had to go looking for but rather something that we could leave around places so we can leave them in coffee shops, we can hand them out on the street, that kind of thing so they'll reach people who wouldn't usually go looking because there's plenty of like left-wing stuff online already. It's not, there is no dearth of that. This way you can reach more people and new people. Uh, um, uh, how many activists are there in here? Oh, I'm, okay. uh, I'm just, I'm just the confused. The or the uh, general one? Uh, that, that dedicate like, their lives to activism. That's what... <laughs> well, well that's, like, that's for you to determine, isn't it? I mean, we all have different definitions. Um, but but I'm, I've been listening, and a lot of this stuff that you say, say sounds good, but I still, I mean, my whole life has been and always has been activism. I still don't understand, you know, how FOSS could help me. I mean, that, sorry, I might be stupid, but... I can't help everyone. I'm like, what I'm, I'm not saying every activist needs to use FOSS. I'm just not I'm comprehending. FOSS can be useful for some activists, <clears throat> and it might be nice for FOSS communities to make more links with activist communities to think about that. Yeah. Can I address your, your question with an example? And I'm not trying to big note myself because I work with a team of people. But I work with people who 15 years ago looked at the gaps in the community sector. And one of the things that we found was technology. They were having a very difficult time with technology. But we felt that technology could really enhance their work. So 14 years ago, we dedicated ourselves to making technology easier for community groups like yours to use. It's had an outstanding effect. And to me, that's the activism that I do in my life. Okay, so about. 30 to 40 percent less money is now spent by these groups on their technology, but they're getting better systems. So basically, our way of helping the community was to help those who are experts at helping the community uh, better achieve their goals through technology. And it, it's having an amazing effect. So there's one example on how FOSS can help you. And the only reason we've been able to do that is because of FOSS. These people were all spending a fortune on proprietary systems that didn't meet their needs, that were sold to them just because some expert told them that's what they needed. And they didn't have the knowledge to know that that didn't really fit their needs that well. So there's one way. Just a quick thing. Um, so uh, the, the, most of the activists that I come in contact with on a day-to-day -day basis, our main problem is getting the word out because you know, people said, don't want an activist to tell them, you know. I think we're straying to more of a comment than a question territory. So maybe we can talk about this over lunch. Thank you. Right, we'll just have one last question before we. Okay. Sure. All right, so we'll just thank Dr. Cross for a speech today.